much. So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this talk. <clears throat> Uh, today I'll be talking about gauge theory on graphs, um, and so this is joint work with my supervisor Sean Majid. And there's two main points of interest in this research. So first, um, lattice gauge theory. So as it's usually done, it doesn't really have a so to speak geometrical approach, so that we can compare it to classical gauge theory or gauge theory on classical manifolds. And we want to kind of bring those two together by analyzing it through the lens of non commutative geometry. And the second, um, just make this too close. Okay. So, and the second point, sorry, can you hear? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. So, and the second goal of this research is to, so gauge transformations and gauge groups are well understood uh, in. Um, universal quantum principle bundles, but when we take non-universal calculi along the fibers, uh, we don't really know what to do. And we wanted to look at such systems in the example of graphs to see exactly what's going on here. Okay, so I'll start with a quick recap of lattice gauge theory as it's usually done. So what we want to take is a directed graph. So this is just a set of vertices X and a set of directed edges E. Uh, we take a Lear finite group uh, G. In this case, I'll be focusing on finite groups. And we take a trivial principal bundle, so X times G over X. Uh, the way that uh, connections are then encoded are then not through the algebra valid one forms usually, but rather through their holonomies. So the idea here is to associate to each edge um, a group element V, right? So that uh, we have the holonomy of this connection already, or really the um, the parallel transport along this connection, uh, this edge, sorry. And gauge transformations are then the association of um, group elements to vertices, right? So we have a function. So essentially, uh, what is happening is that we have a vertex X and a vertex Y. In the edge between them, we have the allonomy, and on the vertices themselves, we have the gauge transformations. And well, they, so gauge transformations act on holomorphisms like this, and this is exactly what you'd expect. So if you have, in classical geometry, a connection, you have uh, its holonomy along a path, and on that holonomy, you also have exactly uh, this gauge transformation regarding the endpoints. So now in physics, what we want to do is to encode the dynamics through what's called an action. And in lattice gauge theory, we take what's called the Wilson action. And in a simple example where we take the square lattice, so just x is equal to z cross z, uh, with arrows going up and down and right and left, what we do is we just look at the fundamental plaquettes. So what we do is we look at holonomies around these fundamental squares. So in one way plus other way. Then we take the um, the character of the holonomies in a specific representation, and we sum overall fundamental plaquettes and overall representations. Uh, and this C is just here because it's some numerical fact. And the way, the reason why we take this is because if we take the limit where the edges go to zero on this lattice, then we recover exactly the young mills functional on R2. So this is just a standard, well, we have the integral of R2, some trace operation, and then F wedge uh, star F, where this star here is the Hodge star. Uh, the thing is, in usual at sketch theory, we can take this action, but this is by no means unique. So we can take other actions that in the limit where the lattice edges, so the spacings go to zero, also converge to the converge to the Young Mills action. And what we want to do is to, well, take this form here and use non-commutative geometry to try to approach it or to try to find a unique action. Okay. So this was a very quick review of lattice gauge theory. Let's see how it looks now from the perspective of non-commutative geometry. So what we want to do is to take as a base, as the base, as I've said before, a digraph. And here, the space of one forms is simply given by the edges. And on the fibers, we want to take a finite group. And here, uh, calculi, so bicovariant calculi are given by Kelly graphs, as was mentioned already before today. And a Kelly graph is just, we take a subset of G without the identity, uh, which for technical reasons, we want to be stable under the joint action and under inverses. And we generate a graph on G. So vertices are the elements of G. And then arrows are just given by right multiplication by elements of this CG. 
Uh, then, if we have a finite group, we can also do more. Uh, well, we have a lot of more structure that we can do. Namely, we can build the full exterior algebra, which is usually well given by the Voronix algebra. So details are not so important for today. And if we assume a metric and a central volume form, so volume form just means that, uh, well, there's a top degree and we assume this form to be central, which is the case for several examples. Then we can have a Hodge star going from omega k to omega top minus k, just as in classical geometry. And we can also, so given a group, we also uh, we can also define an integral operation. And the reason why we need this here, so I wrote g here, but we'll actually take our base x to be to be a discrete group, and then we can build all of this, which is exactly what we needed in order to build a yang mills functional. Okay, given this, let's have a look at uh, gauge theory on digraphs with the universal calculus along the fibers. So we take uh, a graph X with edges E, and on G, so on the fibers, we take the universal calculus, which is simply given by the Cayley graph generated by G minus E. So here uh, we have here our main structures. So we have uh, connections are just one forms with values in the CG plus. This is just so the group algebra and the plus says, uh, so if you look at this as a Hopf algebra, this is just a kernel of the Klee unit. Uh, and you can think of it as the Lie algebra, as playing the role of the real Lie algebra when we take the universal calculus along the fibers. Then for the holonomies, we simply add the identity here. And the reason why we do this is because holonomies in classical geometry are usually just the path order exponentials of connections. And this, uh, at infinitesimal order, so to speak, just identity plus connection. And that's the reason why we do this. Uh, yeah, then curvature is just defined as you will. So as usual, so differential, differential of connection plus alpha wedge alpha. And in the case that we take the base itself to be a discrete group like set cross set, this has a quite simple form, which is just f is, is equal to u wedge u. Then gauge transformations are given by elements in CG cross functions on X uh, with some extra properties that are not important uh, for today. And they act on connections like this. So if we take the theory of quantum principal bundles and see there how gauge transformations act on connections, we can derive this formula. But the really interesting bit is that they act on holonomies like this. So on this holonomy that we define up here. And if you recall that, so the star operation uh, is simply the inverse for elements of the group. Uh, we see that we essentially have a linearization of usual lattice gauge theory, right? So what we're doing here is essentially to every edge, we're associating a holonomy in the sense that we're associating a group, uh, an element of the group algebra. And the same thing for the, for the vertices, for the vertices. Whereas before we are associating elements of the group. Okay. Uh, so let's see now how we can um, define an action functional. So what we're taking here as the base is a discrete group. So X with a Cayley graph generated by CX. I'll give examples in a bit. Uh, we assume that we have a full exterior algebra with a Euclidean metric, central volume form, and hot star so that we can do everything. This works for various examples. And then we just define the angles functional as you'd expect. So F star. So we need a complex structure here so that the whole thing is uh, real. So F star wedge star F, where again, so F uh, wedge star F is just an element of CG plus tensor omega uh, top of X. So a top form, so we can integrate and apply the character of the representation to get a number. This action is gauge invariant when X is a discrete group. And what we found is that using the Hodge star uh, and the fact that F has this simple form for discrete groups on the base, is that this action will only depend on uh, loops of length four. And we can show here that so A, B, C are just elements of the of the set generating the Cayley graph for the base, and A, B, C, D is just the identity. And that's why we have a loop. And some examples of this are just, so X uh, being the square lattice with the Cayley graph, with the set uh, generating the Kelly graph, giving us the square lattice, just going left, right, up, and down. But we could also take here, for example, a triangular lattice. This is uh, 
the Cayley graph here would be going right and left, up and down, and then in the diagonals. But the thing here is nonetheless, the action would only consist of loops of length four. And usually in lattice gauge, uh, lattice gauge theory, one would assume that only the fundamental plaquettes are important for the action, but we find here for this formulation that in a triangular lattice, it's not actually the triangles, but the squares that are important. Um, so far, I've only talked about abelian groups, but we could also do this construction with uh, non-abelian groups on the base if you want. So taking, for example, S3 with, uh, with the calculus given by the generators. Okay, now I want to show you how the action looks like uh, in the case of the square graph, and just so that we are all on the same page, this is what it looks like. So the square graphs that are set, right? And this is the full action. So here, the what we're trying to do is exactly the same as before. So we just consider the holonomies uh, along these loops and then take the trace, right? And what we find here is that these first two terms is exactly what we have in the Wilson action. But then we also get a bunch of terms uh, which are um, given by trivial loops. And the thing is, in lattice sketch theory, it is usually assumed that going one way and then back around the edge gives the identity, but this is not something that you necessarily need to assume in non-commutative geometry. And if we don't assume this, then all of these loops are going to matter and are going to uh, impact the dynamics of the theory. But in principle, we get uh, the Wilson action as you'd expect here in the first two terms. And this generalizes to, so this we can generalize to any other abelian group on the base with calculus, with a calculus given, by, um, well, by a set essentially containing n directions going in one way and then the other. And with the central volume form. Okay, so let's see what happens when you assume, so, so far we've always assumed the universal calculus along the fibers. Let's see what happens when the calculus is non-universal. And here, uh, so what this means is that we take G along the fibers with CG being a strict subset of, of G without the identity. Then what happens is that um, connections are now elements of this space where we take the, the vector space generated by CG um, as the Lie algebra of the group, so to speak tensor uh, forms on the base. And for now, let's consider just gauge transformations again as being in this space. The question now is, is this thing a connection with the formula that we found before? And is the gauge group closed? And what we found is that the way that, so the one way that we found to ensure this is to, instead of considering, so gauge transformations in this space, we consider them as maps from functions on the group to functions on the base. Um, and we restrict them. So usually in this setting, we consider gauge transformation as convolution invertible unital maps. But here we want to restrict them to differentiable algebra maps. So the idea to, to restrict gauge transformation to algebra maps uh, was shown here first in Han and Lundy. And then we extend them to differentiable algebra maps so that they're compatible with the differentiable structures, with the differential structures on the base and on the fibers. And what this means is essentially that this maps is given by a set map from the base to the fibers with this property. So this property essentially means that an arrow on the base is mapped to an arrow on the fibers or to exactly the same point, right? And if we restrict gauge transformations to such maps, then it's not clear whether the gauge group is closed or not under uh, the chosen product. And here we have two cases. So the first case is that we assume uh, that we only have the first bit. So this would, so what would happen here is that we essentially only look at gauge transformations which are constant along connected components of the graph, which, well, it's not so interesting. We'd like to have more uh, interesting gauge transformations going on. But the thing is, from the moment on that we allow uh, this, it gets quite complicated to check whether the gauge group is closed or not. And one way that we found of ensuring this is to impose this condition on the calculus on the Cayley set of G, so to speak. But this is also quite restrictive. So there's not a lot of examples where this is true. And we've also found uh, that the only calculus uh, that is connected and satisfies this is exactly the universal calculus. So if we want to 
consider a calculus which is non-universal and has this property, it will be non-connected, which means that when we take the classical limits, well, we'll probably not get uh, so a connected calculus on the fiber, so we'll not get what we expect for from the theory of principal bundles. But nonetheless, uh, we can find several examples uh, with this property. Uh, and well, here are some of them. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, I guess this was more or less Take it. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so this was more or less the end of my talks, but what's the next one? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Uh, what condition? The, this one. So, yeah. Um, so, this condition, I'm not sure. So because uh, usually you look at the everything using using the convolution product, and one idea that we had but we couldn't find anything was to somehow change the convolution product of the format so that we would not have to uh, impose any of these conditions on the calculus entry, but we could not find such an action or product. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm... Yeah. Thank you very much.